So what's up everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're doing something a little bit different. It's gonna be pretty cool, I think. And that is we're doing a collaboration with Noah of Broken Arrow Bison. And we're gonna talk about rotational grazing bison and longhorns to where you can get grass like this back here where it's going up to our, you know, 14, 15 month old steer shoulders. But the way that this is gonna work is that we kind of interviewed each other. And one part of the interview is gonna be on our channel and the other part is gonna be on Noah's channel. So I'm gonna leave a link to his channel down in the description and an iCard up here, okay? So check that out. After the really interesting conversation I had with Noah, it's actually got me a little bit more open to not only doing longhorns, but maybe adding some bison on a, you know, maybe a rented pasture or something like that. So if you wanna find out why I'm kind of looking into it, let's get started with this interview. So Noah, you do uh, you do bison. It's not buffalo. It's it's bison. You want to explain the little bit of a difference between that? Yeah. Um, so when we first came over, uh, us as in our ancestors came over to the to uh, the Americas, they saw these animals and they thought that they were related to buffalo. Um, they started calling them buffalo and uh, the American Indians started calling them buffalo in their own languages. Um, Tatanka is one of the names for them. Um, well, then the scientists came over and they said, well, no, they're not related to buffalo as closely as we thought. They are actually bison. So the technical term for them is bison bison. Um, they are bison, but buffalo stuck because they got called that for so long. And a lot of the uh, American Indians still call them buffalo. Um, honestly, I like calling them buffalo myself, but I know that they're technically bison, so I'm not gonna um, dog on anybody who calls them one way or the other. I've actually got some uh, American Indian friends that um, call them buffalo, and that's the way they're gonna always call them buffalo, which is uh, kind of cool to me, because I think you know they're they're carrying on the tradition of what their ancestors called them, so. I'm totally fine with either one, but yes, they're technically bison. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool how the, the story happens. But Noah, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're, you're in Kansas, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, so we're located in uh, southeast Kansas. Uh, I was born and raised in Kansas City. Um, we had a, had a farm in Missouri, uh, just south of Kansas City, and uh, through some different circumstances, we had to sell the farm and move and so now we are located in southeast kansas so we've got a lot more uh prairie grass out here um i my last farm i was on there for about four years i was brand new to doing it i'm a city boy i came came from the city wanted to get out um but so when when we had the last farm it was the first one i really kind of started figuring things out there was a lot of fescue that was grown on that farm um, brome and i really kind of figured out the learning curve on that how to raise bison on that we had 15 animals over there uh, and now that we're over here um, the grass is a little bit different the soil is a little different um, the way the animals graze on the ground is is different also so it's not nothing is drastically different it's just a lot of little nuances that i've got to figure out now so well let me ask you this why did you decide to go with bison what 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 intrigued you about them and why did you make that move um it, it i kind of happened into it honestly um i always really lo loved bison um i always thought they were just a coolest majestic animal only saw one or two in person when I was a kid uh, other than just being at the zoo and uh, I wanted I lived in the city was raising my kids in uh, an area that we just decided we want to get out of um, it's kind of some rough rough areas just like uh, sounds like you came from you know and uh, we wanted a little bit of a slower pace faster or slower pace um, life for our kids so I really kind of had a calling to go out to the country but I really didn't want to do something that was traditional ag agriculture um, there's I've got no uh, qualms against anybody who's doing traditional agriculture I've got a lot of friends that are uh, farmers and ranchers which is fine 
Um, but I just didn't really feel good about uh, putting chemicals on the grounds, fertilizers on the grounds that I knew were going to end up leaching into the water system. Um, so wanted to get out in the country, but I didn't know how to actually do that. My mom, uh, she was an organic gardener for my whole growing up. So I was familiar with that side of things, but I wasn't familiar with doing, you know, hundreds of acres of uh, growing organically. So uh, I was up late one night with my wife and brother-in-laws and I ran across an article that talked about how bison were um, actually raised mostly uh, by ranchers. Um, it was like over 60% at the time. And a light bulb just went off in my head and I thought, that's it. And so I just dove head first into it. I got into, um, I joined the National Bison Association, the NBA, and they uh, offer courses as to how to raise these animals. The more I dove into it, the more I was just absolutely fascinated with them. And honestly, um, the more people I talked to and I, I had mentioned, you know, hey, I, want, I think I want to raise bison or buffalo, and they said, oh, you can't do that. They'll jump the fences, they'll do this and that. Uh, the more I wanted to do it, honestly, <laughs> because that's kind of my personality. If somebody says I can't do it, I really kind of want to prove them wrong. So um, that kind of started the journey. Didn't have any land or anything like that. Ended up uh, buying uh, acreage and, and getting our first herd started. And um, we had a little break in there, but I haven't looked back ever since. It's just they are so amazing. I'm always learning something new from them all the time. Um, they're extremely fast. They uh, winter really well. They summer really well. The, the meat is some of the most healthy meat there is out there. Um, and their personalities are just, quite frankly, they're really fun. Um, they, they all have their own personality. They're just a blast to interact with. So with bison, now that's something that I actually looked into um, a little bit before we got our place, but me, I was just a little bit intimidated by them being a newbie and stuff. And they, you know, they're just, they're just bigger than cattle. I mean, I think comparably in weight, they're kind of around the same size, but you just see their heads and they're a little bit more, uh, you know, they're, they're more intimidating. What do you have to say that somebody kind of like in my shoes to where, okay, you, you, you see these bison and you know, you, you, you're thinking about it, but you're just a little bit intimidated or a little bit scared to do it. What would you have to say to them? Now, how often do you have to work these? Is it about the same as cattle or I mean, cause I haven't done it. I haven't worked mine at all because we do stuff a little bit differently, but do you have to get them in? Do you have to give them shots? Is there stuff, is there stuff that we, they, they absolutely require? Or for the most part, are they more hands off than uh, you know your typical you know you know cattle? Um, the biggest thing is like a lot of people uh, look at them as cattle. Um, they see them as kind of the same thing. They're 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 all bovines. They all eat grass. They all kind of do similar things. But all in all, bison are a lot different. Um, the way I kind of look at it is it's there's a difference of a dog and a cat. You know, you're going to treat a dog differently than you are a cat. Um, and bison are the same way. You're going to treat a bison different than you are a beef cow. Um, you can you can put them in a fence uh, that will control beef cows. So there's really not a whole fences. You want to make sure uh, if you've got hot wire, it's really hot. Um, there are some nuances to it. Their coat is almost four times thicker or uh, six times thicker than a cow's coat. So barbed wire doesn't affect them as much. Um, I've got a lot of friends who use barbed wire, so it's not necessarily a bad thing. A friend of mine, uh, uh, Dusty Baker over at Cross Timbers Bison, he runs barbed wire. He has no problems at all. Um, I started... Uh, raising these on hot wire a friend of mine taught me how to run hot wire and so that's kind of my personal preference but raising them is really similar um, the differences that you're going to see is interaction with them so uh, i never try to turn my back on these animals 
the reason is is they're not mean but they are wild um they are not a domesticated animal so that you can tame them down you can have them come to feed uh out of your hand but something might click one day in their head of survival so um you always want to make sure that you have an out uh so you got to think about that a little bit different with cows and then um the corralling system is different so uh like i said before they are um extremely fast and they can jump really high a full-grown bull has been known to jump six and a half feet from a standstill so given that said they they also you don't want to push them you push them they will push back um, so what you want to do is you kind of change your practices from like cows pushing them is you want to lead these animals so you lead them to the corral and then once they're in the corral your corral wants you want that to be um, really strong sturdy you want it to be six 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 and a half foot or taller and um, you want it to be typically made out of metal um, but the advantages to them the disadvantage that you can see out of like you know handling them uh is very very small honestly because the advantages are they are typically 80 to 90 percent hands off um, they are more disease resistant than cattle are um, they move across the pasture in more of a mob area so what that does is it simulates uh mob grazing or intensive grazing actually it's not quite as good as putting them in a smaller area but there's a lot of similarities to it and that's where a lot of the mob grazing and intensive grazing came from um, is actually looking at these animals and how they were tight-knit and all their manure was centralized and, and all their hooves were centralized and they were eating what was right in front of them because the animals right next to them uh, are competing for the same grass so they tend to eat that and then once they move to the next side of the pasture they have this very strong herd mentality so they follow the herd and they don't tend to linger out by themselves and eat the grass that's uh, that's sweeter or, or what they think is best so they're better for the ground um, they're an easier animal to raise believe it or not um, and they're just awesome to have out in the in the field um, they the only drawbacks and I honestly anymore I don't see it as a drawback is just corralling them it's just different you know your, your corrals just need to be different than cattle corrals and the way you handle handle them is just different so a little long-winded but that's kind of the gist of it now how often do you have to work these is it about the same as cattle or I mean because I haven't done it I haven't worked mine at all because we do stuff a little bit differently but do you have to get them in? Do you have to give them shots? Is there stuff? Is there stuff that we they, they absolutely require, or for the most part are they more hands off than uh, you know your typical you know you know cattle? They're they're similar. Um, most of the guys that I know that raise them uh, run them through the corrals once a year. So most of most of the guys do it once a year in the fall. <coughs> Excuse me. There's um. There's a handful of them that will do it twice a year. Um, the reason for that is they are more disease um, resistant than cows, but the thing that they are, um, they have the downfall is parasites. The reason for that is when, before we came over to the Americas, the herds went from Mexico to Canada and Canada to Mexico once a year, they migrated and so they were always in front of their manure um, by doing that uh, their the parasites were always behind them so um, just like what you've talked about on your channel is you know there's there's about a 12-day cycle with parasites well as long as that herd is moving you know 12 days away from that those uh, the feces then they will uh, never really encounter the parasites well what's happened nowadays is we put them into a field like what you see here um, and they're constantly encountering the parasites um, so 
they are not, they haven't developed that immune system. Um, so you do have to worm them if you're not going to uh, be doing active intensive grazing or anything like that. I do know some guys who don't worm them, worm them um, and they have good success with that, but they have really large pastures. They're able to move around and not really encounter the, uh, their uh, feces. Um, so that's, that's kind of the one thing you really have to focus on is, is their uh, worming program. But vaccinations, things like that, uh, yeah, it really comes down to preference. Um, some of these guys vaccinate heavily, some of them don't. So it doesn't sound like they're they're that terribly different um, as far as the facilities the, you know the facilities that you need to in order to to raise them, and that's kind of intriguing to me because our corral system here is made out of metal. We got lucky. We just they, they just you know that's what was here when we bought the place. It's one of the things that really attracted us to it. So if we were to bring bison onto here. Now, the, the barbed wire fences, they're, they're about four feet tall. Would that be able to keep them in or do, would we have to upgrade? Uh, I know guys who have four foot tall barbed wire and have bison, um, that's not a problem. Uh, personal preference, I would go a little bit higher. I had a four foot fence last time. It was all high tensile electric. Um, I, I didn't have any problems with them getting out, but uh, something that a mentor of mine told me is just a general rule of thumb with even just cows is like if the animal can look over the fence uh, they have that temptation to jump it so I moved to a four and a half foot fence that's what I have now but yeah I mean strong I would probably go with a six strand uh, barbed wire but a strong four foot six strand barbed wire will be fine as long as uh, it's big enough and they don't feel too pressured when bison feel cooped up or pressured uh, they have a personality to push back so they don't they that's one of the things I honestly I love about them is uh, they do not lay down and take it if they don't like it they will make changes to to whatever circumstances they're in now can you keep them with cows or do they have to be completely separate can I what now can you keep the bison with cows or do they do they have to be completely separate or can you keep them with sheep or you know can you mix them with other animals or do they you know do they kind of boss them around do they hurt them or I mean is it something that you could keep you know with other animals yeah so um, I had uh, a small amount of beef cows w at my last place and I did keep them over there with them uh, it wasn't a problem what I noticed was that the animals tended to uh, sit in separate pastures, separate parts of the pasture. They don't really mingle. Um, I didn't see any bossing around. I didn't see them pushing anybody or anything like that. So I don't think there's too much of an issue there. I did try a horse out there with them um, and I wouldn't recommend that. The horse tended to run them around, get them riled up. And like I said, they can kind of get dangerous when uh, they want to push back. So, you know, most of the time, 95% of the time, they're super docile, just sitting in the middle of the field, but put an animal out there that wants to agitate things, um, you wouldn't want to do that. Uh, as far as sheep or goats or th things like that, I wouldn't recommend it uh, because there is a uh, disease that sheep and goats carry. It's, uh, I believe it's called malig malignant catarrhal fever and they can transmit that disease to the bison and they are not resistant to that disease. Uh, I don't think it's as big of an issue if you have a couple animals. It's more of an issue uh, when you have a lot of sheep and a lot of, uh, they're, you know, just crowded. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, for the, for the most part, they, they will handle being in the same pasture as other animals. They just tend not to uh, mingle. They, they tend to stay to themselves. The bison and cattle can cross breed, is that correct? They can. Uh, it is not a... Well, I don't know if I'd recommend that. No. But um, I mean, is, that, is that something that, that you've explored or is that something that is, uh, is kind of being practiced at all or on, on any kind of scale? Yeah, uh, it is being practiced. It's not a natural um, occurrence. 
So they do have to uh, put them in the same pen and, and uh, try to get them to breed. There are what's called beefalo, which are, I wanna say they're somewhere in the range of like 30% uh, buffalo and, and the rest are beef cows, uh, they're genes. Um, I'm a member of the National Bison Association and one of the things that the National Bison Association has pledged and they have all their members pledge is to not interbreed these animals with beef. Uh, just because they're so unique, we wanna be able to keep that DNA pure. Um, they're, you know, way back when, turn of the 19th century, there was uh, some guys who were breeding uh, beef with these animals and uh, they were creating uh, trying trying to basically increase the numbers um, it wasn't really helping a whole lot but some of that gene got into some of the animals so there's a lot of guys out there that are working to um, eliminate that DNA so they'll they'll run testing on them and, and see if they're they're pure the uh, amount of beef gene or DNA that are in here if they have any is so minute you can't even tell but uh they really really there's a real big push movement to try to keep these animals pure and i'm i'm, I'm along those lines so there are cool really cool uh animals that you can cross them with like um charlets uh if you were to uh they're all coming over here to check things out again but if you were to breed one of these to a charlet the the white gene in the charlet is dominant and then if you were to breed it back to a buffalo you know five six generations you'll get what looks like a pure buffalo that's white um so there are guys out there doing that because you know they sell they sell for a lot at the sale barns white buffalo they everybody thinks oh it's really rare which white buffalo is but that one actually isn't because it's just been bred for it. Well, I'm glad that you're not doing that because I mean, I'm, I'm all for the, I'm in the field of, you know, keep science out of farming, you know, let it be as natural as you can possibly, possibly can be. You know, there's some, there's some things that you have to do, you know, electric fence, that's science but you're letting the animal be the animal, you know, letting the bison be the bison, letting the cow be the cow, not, you know, put in so much of a human imprint on it. So that's really awesome that you are, you know, keeping the bloodlines a lot more pure. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I think that there's a reason why they're like this. Um, you know, one of the questions that I get sometimes is, man, do they have problems birthing? And no, they actually don't at all. Um, they sure they can have problems just like anything else but in a general sense they don't have problems birthing and people say well their their back end is so small you know that doesn't look like it would work but they were made for this um, they were made to reproduce and to be able to have a success rate that will make the species continue and so one of the problems that you see with beef cows um, in like the newer uh, the newer breeds, like the Anguses and stuff, is they've bred them to be able to get you know, for instance, a bigger brisket. But then in return for doing that, you lose uh, some of the things that they have as a natural uh, instinct to keep themselves alive. So then you have um, you know bigger cows or or problems birthing. Um, so that's one of the things that just awesome benefit is like like you said if you leave them as close to the way they were when they were made as possible and not not mess around with them you'll have a lot more success and i think you kind of see that in uh, those longhorns those longhorns are a lot closer to what the original cow was um, they have uh, adapted to their environment for a lot they've had a lot longer time frame um, and you can have a lot more success that way. That's actually one of the things that uh, I had, uh, like, I had to make a decision on: is are we gonna, you know, I was thinking in the beginning, there's a possibility we might breed uh, beef cattle to the Longhorns. That way, we can put on a little bit more beef. 
But I went, you know what? These things have developed for hundreds of years out in the wild by themselves. Why mess with it? Why mess with it at all? They're, they're perfect the way they are. Right, yeah, and that, that's kind of the way I've, I've taken my approach to things. There, I mean, there are some things that uh, I am, I do kind of adapt to. Uh, I mean, your viewers probably saw that uh, I threw range cubes out to them. Well, I'm not that big of a fan of grass-fed animals, but range cubes for me with these animals is an insurance policy. Um, if these animals ever got out of the fences, you're gonna have a really hard time getting them back in because they don't respond to pushing. So they respond to leading. Um, so what, one of the things that I've done is I'll go and I'll feed them range cubes once or twice a week it's literally each one is maybe getting a handful once or twice twice a week like candy um, doesn't really affect their immune system and their their health as much as it is an insurance policy for me that you know if i need to to call them into a corral i all i have to do is go whistle to them and they come running so uh i'm not you know i'm not by any means dogging anybody who who doesn't just put them out on on pasture and and let them run you know there is there is a management aspect to it also so and you know, everybody's everybody's situation is different so you just do it for a little bit but the, the way that you are set up you sell seed stock you're not selling bison for processing is that correct yeah currently um so the animals that i have now i bought them all as calves uh they're all turning yearlings right now um Buffalo will breed in their second year, and then their third year typically have a calf if they are up to weight. Uh, the females need to be somewhere around 700 pounds or above to be able to uh, not abort the fetus. So, uh, yeah, there. Eventually, I will be selling breeder stock. Uh, I don't do any meat uh, right now. Maybe in the future, but um, it's just not. Not uh, something that our family has des decided that we're going to get into at the moment. What kind of, uh, how much land do you need for buffalo? Is it similar to cows? I mean, it, like as far as stocking density, you know, are they a lot bigger than cows? Or do they mean, need a lot more, a uh, lot more land? Or is it, you know, kind of same kind of stocking density? It's uh, very similar to cows, uh, the stocking density. It's actually slightly less. Uh, uh, acreage per animal. Um, the reason for that is buffalo tend to eat a little bit more uh, roughage than beef cows do. They are they're slightly closer to the the side of like what a goat would be than uh, than a beef cow. They aren't as picky, um, so they are are actually. Um, a better decision when it comes to if you've got you know I wouldn't recommend anybody getting one bison at all uh, because they're a herd animal I would recommend a minimum of three I started out with three uh, you can I I bought bought one brought it home bought another brought it home brought bought another one brought it home and uh, I definitely could see a difference in the behavior of the animals um, they weren't as agitated when they had buddies around so I would I would have a minimum of three but from there uh, just look up your stocking density rates if you're not going to do uh, rotational grazing or mob grazing um, but I would highly recommend you do and uh, figure out how much land um, that requires and you could put a little bit more a little bit more per acre with these animals that's really interesting I thought because you know they just look and seem so much bigger you'd, you'd have to need more acreage but it's actually less that's that's pretty cool yeah they're actually it's funny because they, they look like they're bigger but they're not honestly um, the cows range from about 700 pounds to a thousand pounds give or take uh, they can go over that but uh, and then the the bulls will be somewhere in the nature of 18 15 to 2,000 pounds somewhere around there they look bigger because of their hump 
that that's a whole skeletal structure that holds their head up it allows them to push uh, snow around in the winter you don't have to worry about snow covering up the grass or anything like that with these guys they they'll push the snow around and it provides a really really strong uh, defense mechanism with their head that's really pretty cool, you know, so they'll, they'll push snow around unlike cattle, so it's not, uh, you, they're not in dire straits for hay all the time. Let me ask you this, Gore, uh, Noah, the, you're from Kansas City originally, right? Like the city city. Right. What really, right. What, what really made you go, okay, I'm moving out to the country? What, was there a certain moment or what, was there just a, a pull out that way or what was it? Um, it's, it was a pull. Uh, I grew up going up to North Missouri with on my grandparents' farm um, every month or two as a kid, and uh, my grandfather had a hobby farm up there, um, had quite a few acreage, uh, but that was kind of, that was some of the best days of my growing up. I remember going up there and tractors, four-wheelers, the smell of bacon. Um, it just it just called to me um, got to my teenage years and early 20s and I thought ah you know maybe I'll move out to California or Florida um, the farm life just wasn't for me and once I started getting kids and uh, looking at what I really wanted as you know uh, a holistic lifestyle I really wanted to get back to it um, and so we came you know, we, we worked really hard to get acreage and it's just, I, I wouldn't look back at all. Um, it's been a journey, it's been hard. Uh, there's, you know, some hurdles you gotta overcome uh, as far as even just financially, but it's well, well, well worth it. Um, when we first started, uh, you know, looking into getting land, I was making, you know, 14 bucks an hour. And uh, so it's not something that's uh, non-doable. If anybody wants to get out to the country, they want to do a lifestyle like this, it's out there. Um, you just got to work for it and um, it's well, well worth it. Slower pace, um, a, lot, a lot of really good people out in the country who, who have your back. I've met a lot of really good friends. That, that's one thing that I really noticed the big, between the big difference between city and country is the people are just so much nicer. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really, really special. I mean, on the, the highway that we live off of, you know, somebody gets a flat tire, you're gonna have some, you know, two, three, four people stop to help them like within just a couple minutes. I mean, it's, it's that, that's just part's really cool. And everybody really has your back and, you know, they wanna see you succeed and they wanna help you. I mean, it's just really, really special. Noah, let me ask you this. The um, you you bought your farm when was it? How how long ago was it? Um, the current one we're on right now uh, will be here about uh, four and a half years now. How big is it now? Uh, it's sixty acres. Sixty acres. Where in twenty years, where do you see your farm going, or what would you like to see? You know, just to turn into. Um, yeah, so I've got pretty big aspirations. Um, I plan on growing these animals obviously we've got a we're not there we're not waiting for them to uh, produce calves uh, where we'll be purchasing animals but the eventual herd size I want is about three to five hundred animals um, I want this to be something that I can pass on to my kids and I want to be able to uh, kind of leave a legacy of not not just uh, something I'm doing but something my kids and my grandkids can have if they want it so that's kind of our end goal is, is to actually be a, a mid to large size operation. That's pretty awesome, man. I mean, three to 500 animals, that's a, that's a significant herd. That, that's impressive. How much land do you think you'd need in order to be able to achieve that goal? Um, it depends upon how we can figure out the uh, intensive grazing, honestly. Um, if we can figure out the intensive grazing and we can get good ground, then Probably somewhere around a section is what I'll need. Uh, if, uh, if I mean, I could even go lower than that, half section. If uh, I can't figure it out and you just run them out in the middle of the field, then you're you're talking 
you know, a thousand or more acres. But uh, you really don't have to, like if you're, if you're wanting to get to that size, it, it sounds like a lot. It sounds like, okay, now I'm gonna, I gotta purchase all these animals and then I've gotta purchase the land. It's really not that complicated. Um, the average price for ground in my area to rent is $35 an acre. Um, if you sit down and you do the math with these animals, these, these animals will make you more per acre, significantly more per acre than you will on with uh, traditional beef cows. Well, traditional beef cows, you know, the, the average density rate around here is like five and a half or six acres per cow. Per cow. So you take that and you do the math of, okay, they're only able to spend, the average rancher is only able to spend $35 an acre. Well, let's say we um, intensive graze these guys, okay? We pull them, we pull the, the five and a half density rate down to one or two acres, or you cut it in, you cut it in half. Let's just say you cut it in half. That means feasibly, you could spend $70 an acre rental ground and still be making money. Um, so that's kind of the idea that I've been looking at is once we max out the 60 acres, uh, we're going to be looking at rental ground if we're not able to purchase. If we're able to purchase ground, great. Uh, if not, then it's out there. You know, you can, you can spend 50, 60, 70 dollars an acre on rental ground get a good relationship with the landowner that wants to see an American icon on their field and uh, you know take care of the ground fix their fences and you have very 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 cheap ground that you can run these animals on you said something there that I was I've been thinking for a while and that you can pay more per acre especially with the the, the mob grazing and that's what that's what we're looking at you know right now we have 22 head you know one baby 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 calf um on 30 acres we have two llamas and we're going to be getting uh, a few alpacas here in a couple weeks that is something that you know being able to have that if you want to call it leverage um compared to everybody else to go in and blow them away as on the land prices the, or the rental prices because you can make just so much more so that is something that I'm 100% considering because we're close to getting maxed out here. I mean, we're, we're technically way overstocked for the area, but because, you know, we're, we're, we're moving them every day, we have almost three foot grass right now on 90% of it. But that is a very interesting aspect that I think a lot of people really need to consider is that you can blow these other people away when it comes to competition as far as paying for land. Oh yeah, I mean it's a, like I said before, it's like it's a, it's not only a huge benefit to the ground, but it's a benefit to yourself as a business owner. Um, you know, you can you can come in there and and it's hard for somebody who's using traditional agricultural practices to compete with that. You know, if your stocking density is six acres per animal and somebody's stock somebody else's stocking density is is one per acre like how do you compete with that unless you change the way you're doing things that's what that's really where i see it going you know where when it becomes the 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 pocketbook issue people are going to realize okay i have to make a change or i'm going to get blown out of the water here and you know that's where I think in the next 10 years, you're gonna see a lot more people switch over to, you know, rotational grazing, mob grazing, or just a lot more management when it comes to their cattle because they're just, they're gonna get priced out of the market. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people out there um, who complain, and I've, I've heard it countless times of there's no money in agriculture anymore. You know, the, the grain prices are too high, the stocking rates are too high, the, the land prices are too high. And you just can't make it and yeah if you do the math on the way the general public uh raises animals or crops no you can't it's really hard to get started and it's really hard to keep going but if you change the way you think if you change the way you uh are doing things you 100 percent can um these animals here just to be 
completely transparent. Um, I paid $1,100 for uh, three of them, paid uh, $1,400 for one, paid, uh, I believe it was $1,500 for the other two, the bowl was $2,000. That's as calves, and that is fair market value. Um, the These animals as calves are worth close to $2,000. You switch that over to beef cows and they're worth under $1,000. Well, if you have an animal that um, is on the ground one per acre and it's producing $1,500, $2,000 out of the calf every year, it's not it's not bad profit. Um, it's, it's way, way, way more sustainable than traditional agriculture. That's exactly, wow. I mean, well, one, you got a heck of a deal on your first few, that's for sure. And then, you know, just to see when, when you can make more money doing things this way, that's where the change is going to be. And it's really cool to see, you know, there's starting to be more younger people getting involved with it. Because, I mean, I'm still 27. My birthday's in a couple days. How old are you? You you're, you got to be right around the same age. Is that right? Yeah, I got a couple years on you. I'm uh, 33. Okay, well, I mean, it's cool to see younger people get involved, and that's it's got to be the biggest change because what's it called? Joel Salton, he said, you know, in his one of his speeches that in the next 10 years, half of all farmland is going to be changing hands. And I feel like the younger generation needs to get a you know, get their hands on it before Bill Gates and his Monsanto stuff does, right? Right, you're absolutely right. I was uh, I was 26 when I first got started into Buffalo. Wow, so you've been in it a while and you, you know what you're doing and it's just really cool, you know, hey, this is a different avenue, this is a different way of making a living, you know, people that, you know, probably like us that don't want to be in an office all day long, this is nice to be able to walk out to every night and, or every morning and be able to get our hands dirty a little bit and it doesn't take too terribly much time but also be able to keep a, a, a side job if you need to in order to fund it while you're getting started. Right, right, I mean this is uh heck of a lot better than flipping bur burgers at McDonald's I'll, I'll tell you that um, and you know I wouldn't I wouldn't go back at all they're so much fun to raise well no it was really great having you on I learned a lot actually I'm really really now a lot more interested in Buffalo than I was and kind of you know maybe not as intimidated and hopefully that's uh, how a lot of people at home are feeling the same way and hey you know it'd be great to bring back the the great American Buffalo yeah, yeah. Well, thank you ha for having me on, Ryan. Um, I really commend what you're doing. Uh, all the practices that you're doing are, are awesome. Um, that's what we need. We need younger guys to be able to uh, really focus on this land and the next generation and say, okay, let's, let's figure out how to, how to leave this land better than uh, what we had. So that's Noah from Broken Arrow Bison. I mean, incredible channel, incredible guy, incredible bison. I think that really I'm going to look into it a little bit more. Maybe we can expand a little bit and maybe add a couple bison because it sounds like a like a good deal. And if he can figure out how to rotational graze them, I'm going to be asking him a lot of questions. And it might be something that we add here in the somewhat near future. Be sure to go see the second part of the interview on his channel. Again, a link down in the description to that. If you like what you see, consider subscribing to him. So with that, we hope to continue to bring you great, interesting, just different kinds of content and hopefully it opens your mind up to changing the way that agriculture is normally done.